Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us live here today for the Alliance of Independent Authors member q and I'm here as ever with the man who has all the answers, Mr. Michael Oran. Hi, Michael. Hi, Orna. Oh, that's such a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know that I have all the answers, but I, I certainly can make up some things if I need to. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing really well, thank you. And um, but I'll tell you, I have just noticed that I don't have headphones in, which is going to cause problems with our sound, isn't it? So can you hold on for one second? Just do an, an intro to the questions that we're going to be doing while I get yeah. some headphones. Thanks. Well, absolutely. So first off, hello to all of our listeners who are listening live and hello to all of our listeners and viewers in the future who are uh, listening to the show. We have, I have to say, we had some amazing questions come in over the past month or two. So if you haven't gotten your question answered yet, just remember that I do go through every question and I do make sure that we all get get you an answer. So even if we don't answer it on the show or answer it live today, you should still get some sort of email response from me with your question. We, we may be a little backlog, so it may take some time for us to get to it, but just know that we do answer every question. And I have to say, we got some really good, uh, really good marketing questions. We got some really insightful copyright questions, which I, I always love copyright questions. We got some good rights questions. So uh, with that, I, I think we'll go ahead and dive into it. Are you ready, Orna? I am ready. Thanks there, okay. uh, folks, for your patience. So yeah, off you go, Michael. Let's start. Okay. So our first question of the month comes from Faith, and she has an Ingram Spark question. She asks, will Ingram Spark promotion for Ally members continue in 2020? Yes is the short answer. Um, the discount is up and running and it's in the member zone. So it's just a matter of logging in, go to discounts and deals and you'll find it there. All right. And, and that we entitled, sorry, for those who don't know, that entitles you to free setup and free revision. So it really is a very valuable discount. Now, a lot of our uh, partner members do great discounts and you know uh, a member can actually make their their membership fees back in no time uh, with the discounts that are available but that if you're interested in print at all that ingram spark is a, is a really good discount absolutely all right we have a question from thomas and thomas has a he's got kind of a long question so i'm gonna i'm gonna work my way through this here so uh, thomas has successfully uploaded his book to both Ingram Spark and Amazon. And the cost of printing and binding, uh, apparently he has a color book. So the cost of printing and binding with Ingram and Amazon are slightly different. Like it's, there's like a, a five or $6 difference. So he's got a couple of different questions. Um, the first is he wants to publish both of them naturally because of the expanded distribution. But what is the most ethical way of letting the public know that the, the price of, both books are different, even though it's the same book because it's being distributed by Ingram and, and Amazon and they've got different printing costs, if yeah, that makes sense. I do, I understand completely. And this arises out of Amazon's determination to be the best value retailer. And that doesn't just apply to books, that's an Amazon policy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they always price match or reduce a price wherever mm -hmm. they find it. So it's always going to be the case that your book on your own website or through another um, supplier like Ingram or, or your ebook too, it's not, this, is, this just isn't uh, about print. Amazon will always price match or lower the price. So if you do a, a run of um, an offer on your website for your close readers say, and they realize that that is there, they will price match. So in terms of letting people know, the, I think what he's, he's kind of getting at is he wants his readers to be able to purchase the lower cost edition if that's what they want to do. I think the best way to let them know is on your own website um, and just say, you know, that they give, point them in both directions because price is very significant for some buyers but it's far less significant for others. So uh, we would be aware of buyers who would rather not buy on Amazon and who are very, for whatever set of reasons, in the, could be political reasons, could be whatever, they don't like what online shopping is doing to the world, or whatever it might be, 
Um, so I think it's a, it's just a matter of being clear with your information, wherever you have control of that information is all you can do. So there is no perfect, complete answer to this, but just do your best through your own website and list both prices and explain that both are available and then let the reader um, do their thing. Absolutely. Great answer. And we've got some great comments going on right now in our live uh, live chat arena here. So uh, Lorraine Turnbull says, hello. Hello, Lorraine. Hi from London, MC Vasiago. Dale L. Roberts is in the house. Hello, Dale. Mr. Roberts. To yes. Back. <laughs> and uh, Dale says that the when we were talking about the Ingram Spark uh, benefits that we get, that's the best part of Ally, one of the best perks. I have to agree. And Sally McGinty asks, are all today's questions already set or can we ask related follow-up questions as you proceed? Oh, please do, Sally, put your questions. I mean, the whole point of us doing this live on Facebook, it goes out as a podcast anyway, but the whole point of us doing it live and, you know, Michael and I not recording it in a, a dark corner somewhere um, is that people can turn up live and can ask follow on questions or bring your own questions that are unrelated. If we have time, we'll get to those as well. So yeah, just pop your question into the comment box. Absolutely. All right. Our next question is from Sandra, and this is the, the perennial ISBN question that we get on the show. And Sandra has just published a book and um, she's got gotten an email from Nielsen actually saying that she needs a different ISBN for her different formats. Is it true that you need a different ISBN for each format of your book? Yes, you do need a different ISBN for each format that is ally policy as well and can i just say that we have a the ultimate guide to isbns went up on the blog yesterday with an extract from michael's book um a pre pre-publicity extract from the book that uh, michael is bringing to us in in a couple of months time and all about isbns answering all the questions that we've received on this show Nielsen themselves are contributing to the post. We have a case history of a, an author who, you know, makes a very strong case as to why authors should have their own ISBNs and so on. So yes, you do need a different ISBN for each format. Each format being ebook, print, paperback, print, hardback, large print, audiobook. Understanding the need for different formats and so on is best understood if you put yourself in the shoes of a bookseller or a library who wants to stock your book. They want to know what kind of book they're getting. If they're looking for the audiobook, they don't want the hardback turning up in, um, in a box. So you need to kind of work out um, just what formats are you producing in and do a different ISBN for each of those. Now, Nielsen and other ISBN sellers may try to convince you that you need a different ISBN for Amazon and a different one again for Google Play and a different one again for Publish Drive. That's platform and that's not ally policy. One for, for ebook and the platforms are distributors. They're not publishers. You are the publisher. So just one per format. That's all you need. All right. And that is a wrap for that question. So always a good answer as always. So our next question comes from Karen. And Karen asks a very insightful question about 99designs book covers. Has anyone used 99designs book covers? And if so, how would you rate your experience? Thank you. Okay, so if there is anybody listening who wants to hop in, who has used 99 and wants to tell us about that, that's fine. Um, but, you know, the thing about book covers is you get the best book cover you can afford at the time. And that mm -hmm. varies. You know, what you're able to do is going to vary very much depending on the budget you have and so on. So I have heard great things about 99 um, designs. I have heard terrible things about yeah. 99 designs. And I'm sure the same can be said for every single designer out there because design is very personal and who you work with is very personal and the result you get is you know a matter of all sorts of different factors come in there 
So have you used the Michael personally? I, I have. I, I used them. I thought you might have. Yeah, can you talk about your experience? Sure. So so I, I agree with what you're saying. I've heard mixed reviews for both of them. Here, here's what I'll say about 99designs. 99designs is great when you don't have a cover designer. You know, if you don't have a, pre, a prior relationship and you want you want to get a lot of different covers and a lot of different ideas because maybe you have a book that's in a genre that might be a little bit more difficult to manage. Um, there, there could be any number of reasons you would want to do it. I used it for one of my series and then I ended up backing out of it because I wasn't happy with the results that I got. Um, overall, the platform is fine. Um, I do think that you want to make sure you read the fine print. There's some things in the terms of service that I wasn't you know, crazy about like exclusivity there's some exclusivity, you know, with the with the designer, and you have to, you're locked into their platform for a little while. At least that's what it was when I was there. Um, so you have to make your own decision on that. But I've seen some great covers come out of 99 Designs. I yeah. really have, and I, I think that it's a place where you see a lot of beginning cover designers start as a way to build their portfolio, which there's nothing wrong with. I mean, at the end of the day, if you get a cover that you like, great. Um, if you pay for the the bottom tier service you're probably not going to get as good results as if you went for like the middle tier. So I think a lot of people go to 99 designs because they think it's a way to save money. Personally, if it were me, I would go to 99 designs with the same mindset that I'm, I'm going to pay exactly what I would have paid a professional designer one off. Um, and I think if you approach it with that mindset, you'll have better results. Yeah, exactly. And if I might say that we have our directory of designers who are partner members who are all vetted by the watchdog desk. And we've quite a list of designers there. So there are some of them who are really working, you know, giving design book covers at really good rates. So I would invite you to take a look at the Ally uh, Services directory. We've just brought out the 2020 edition. And We've done a lot of the work for you in the sense that every designer in there and indeed we've got editors and all the different services that you need they have all um got really good reviews from members that we know you know we've seen their stuff it's been better by the, the watchdog desk so if you are looking for a designer the thing about your cover designer and your editor is it's about finding a person that you have a great relationship with and you might have two or three designers that you like to work with on different kinds of genre and different kinds of books but over time if you can work together you get to know each other's mindset they know they can bring in things you know that they wouldn't can't do uh, as a one-off but it's a highly creative process so there are absolutely no rules you can just get an off-the-shelf cover that really pops and really works that cost very little money you can pay a fortune for something that somehow falls flat but it um it's one of the most enjoyable i think um and one of the most creative aspects of being your own publisher and it should be it should be something that you enjoy so a kind of a mixed answer there and going yep. around the field a little bit but yeah good luck with your cover yep so nothing wrong with it as as with anything just vet vet your designers and make sure that they they get you a design that you want. So, all right, JT asks, uh, the spirit of its question essentially is, Amazon price matches print books, but do any of the other big retailers do price matching as well? Um, there is a whole issue around Google Play and it's in transition. So I'm not going to kind of go into that in a big way. The thing about it, I'm, I'm kind of wondering what's behind the question. So it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting because you can have this scenario where, you know, if, if a lot of people were to start price matching, suddenly you've got this spiral to the absolute bottom. Yeah. So I think if I could kind of, of say no as a broad answer and just come yeah. in and say that the most important thing about pricing, pricing is, is, is a very important tool as a self-publisher. And it's one of the advantages that we have as indie authors is that we have the ability to play with price and to use it as a promotional tool and to maybe undercut other books in our genre, though whether that works ultimately is questionable. But pricing is important is what, is what I'm trying to mm -hmm. say. Yeah, and no, the, I, I agree. And that's a, the, yeah. the he's just doing some research and he wanted to know, uh, for for example, if Amazon price masters a book and then he lists it lower on Smashwords, will, will Smashwords 
start discounting. He just wants to go down and down. Wanted to avoid that 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 race to the bottom. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) And and generally speaking, no, that you know. Yeah, he's okay there. Yeah, Yeah. you'll be you'll be fine. All right. So our next question comes from Paul, and his question is: I want to create a second edition of my book, but I'm worried about losing my reviews and losing just the 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 credibility and, and the uh, prestige that comes with time on the market. So what can I do to bolster my new edition when I publish it? Yeah, it's a really good question. And in fact, um, Sally has raised something similar. I'll just read hers out because it, it's a, a, essentially a similar question. College Board used the same ISBN for the first six editions of my book. So presumably they published it first, sorry. And when I took over the publication rights, Ingram Spark was fine with the old ISBN, but ProQuest says it's required if the underlying publisher changes to, to change the ISBN. She is confused and she asks um, a new ISBN will, will wipe out my reviews, right? So same same sort of question mm-hmm. um, yeah. or, or, or connected. So yeah. If you're going for a new edition, and we have to every so often at Ally, we're always kind of putting our our new editions out. There is a function whereby you can talk to Amazon and ask them to transfer over your reviews, and mostly they do. And um, so you you don't necessarily lose your previous review. So that's something that I would definitely do. But I think you have to treat a new edition of a book, and, and we're guilty of not always doing this. But in an ideal world, um, where you you leave enough time and enough space to treat the new edition as essentially a new book. So you do all the things that you would do when you're preparing to put out um, a new book for the first time, all the ideal things that you would do. You'd start planning out about, about three months in advance. You'd start um, getting reviews, You know, sending the book out to be reviewed by people uh, who will also hop in on the day of publication and do reviews for you. You begin to let people in that niche know about the book and all the various ways that you, you you want to do that, whatever your chosen methods of marketing and promotion are. So essentially treat the new edition as if it is a new book, because in a way it is. There isn't there is some advantage in being a long time on a platform, but if unless the book is doing really well, if you've got a plan for a new edition, if and if the new edition is good, you should be able to with kind of your new knowledge and the growth of the niche since the last time you put it out as a new book. So when it was completely new, you would presumably since then, you've gathered in a lot more of the right readers for that kind of book. You're more in touch with them. You're better at what you do. The book is better and so on. So uh, the advantages of the new edition can often outweigh the the disadvantages. Agree. I agree with everything you said. So... All right, so we have an important question from our member, Keith. I'm gonna read his question and then I'll summarize it. So, are author websites really worth it? I mean, who actually sells any significant quantity of books via their website? Or who tallies up a sizable email list with it? And not all writers find value in blogging for the sake of it. I get that we don't want Amazon to rule the indie publishing world, but while lousy, boring websites are cheap, a good one isn't. It's a significant investment in time and money to maintain an up-to-date commerce-capable site. I'm set to publish my first novel. It's finished through professional editing and book design today, but my author website, should that be a part of my marketing plan? Why not just rely on Amazon and Goodreads and and page reads and BookBub and all those sorts of things? Um, I just don't understand why I need a website. So the spirit of the question is, why do I need an author website if the chances of selling books through it are so slim and if it costs so much money? Okay, great, great question. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, I'm going to sort of talk a bit about it from, you know, the point of view of self-publishing 3.0 and the whole industry a little bit, but also the individual author over time. So a one book author is starting out and, you know, wanting to get their book out there is not going to be served very well, particularly a, a novelist who doesn't have the ability to use search SEO to draw people to their website. It's going to be very challenging for somebody with one book to do anything, any action whatsoever on their website. Absolutely agreed. 
And for the same reason, one, you know, on their first book, some authors choose to um, go Amazon only. And, you know, we understand that decision. However, we very strongly recommend that indie authors have not only a website, but as you say, a commerce capable website. Why? Mm -hmm. So it's all about assets, creative assets and the building of creative assets over time. So what you're talking about in terms of getting your book going on Amazon, all that investment in other people's companies to advertise your book, to, you know, to get it up there, to get it out there. You haven't at the end of that process actually built anything that you own yourself. You've built your company on somebody else's land. Now that may be okay, but we are suggesting that for the majority of authors, it makes more sense to actually build your own website and over time it's not something that happens immediately and not exclusively we're not for a second suggesting that's all you do but definitely you should have a situation that if somebody comes on to your website and particularly if you've paid money to gain that person through advertising or whatever that they have the ability to go on into your shop and buy your book uh, in ebook edition. So it doesn't actually cost a huge amount to have an e-commerce capable website to sell audiobooks and ebooks, digital products. Yes, when you get into print, it gets more tricky. But when, when you turn up in Google, when you turn up in search, when people go to your website, if they want to buy your book and you're sending them off to Amazon, one part of it is that you get less money. But a more important part of it is if they make a, a, a purchase on your book, you now have an email address, you now have a fan, you now have a known follower. Amazon will never tell you who bought your book. You will never know who that who they are. They are using your creative talent to build their business, which is absolutely fine if that's what people want to do and they sign up to do that. But we would argue strongly, and there are a lot more reasons um, behind this, and it's, it's teased out and explored a lot in our self-publishing 3.0 booklet, which is currently being updated for 2020. So in a, in a couple of weeks time, if you take a look at that book, I think it lays out the reasons as to why you do it. It's not about today. It's not about this first book that you're about to publish. It's about realizing that building um, the creative asset of an author business is something that happens over time, step by step, asset by asset. And so at the end of two years, three years, you've got something that's yours that you can rely on that nobody can take away from you. That's the logic. Yeah, you know, I think I, I always think about it like this. I get it because hosting is not cheap. It's it's absolutely not cheap. The cost associated with being able to take credit cards and things like that to your website is not cheap, and you've got to constantly maintain it. So I, I get it. I think about it like this: if you were running a business like a brick and mortar business with a physical location, you can either choose to rent that location or you can own it, right? And you can rent for a time because that might be cheaper and you've got to get your expenses off the ground, makes sense. But at some point you're going to want to own your own building. And the reason for that is because you don't want to be at the whims of, of a landlord. If a landlord raises his rent, then you're going to, you're going to get screwed. If they build a highway or they, you know, they do something with the highway and then all of a sudden you lose your traffic, then your flower shop is going to have to do a whole lot of marketing and it might even go out of business, right? So it's better to own your own real estate. It, it's more expensive, but at the end of the day, nobody can take it away from you. So just to it's just to put a finer point on what Orna said. And honestly, a, a good website, um, even if it's a brochure type website, that's a cost to play in the ball game. You know, you, you, they won't even let you in the stadium at, at this point. I mean, if, if a reader looks you up, do you want them to find your Amazon page or do you want them to come to your website where you control the branding? Because if, if you rely on Amazon and Goodreads, you don't control it. So, you know, just think about it like that. It, it, I've always seen it as more of a branding play. Yeah, sure. My website doesn't drive a high percentage of my sales, but the sales that it does drive, those are probably my most engaged folks. Definitely. And over time it builds. And I think there's something here for the entire community. If we're all 
just selling our books on Amazon. And I, I, I get that the questioner gets this, but I just want to kind of uh, just say it for the sake of saying it. If, if we're all exclusively selling our books on Amazon and not on other platforms and not on our own, then we are training the readers to go buy there. If readers know that, hey, authors sell books on their own websites and you get all these cool things and you can become a, a reader member. And, you know, if your website is attractive and you have lots of things going on there that make your right reader get excited, then and that becomes something that readers know happen. Readers really love that. They want to buy from you. They will buy not just your book, they'll buy other things. They'll buy your presence. They'll buy, you know, you to turn up to a small group of them and chat about the book. Think about your own favorite authors and what you would pay for the experience of having their time and, and so on. So it's it's about getting outside the the mentality of the book being the only way we can get our mission, our passion, our influence, our impact out there in the world mm -hmm. and understanding the power we have as authors and taking hold of that and getting a lot more creative around all of that. Now, I get it. Writing and publishing your first book and getting it up on Amazon, that's a big ask mm -hmm. and you've got enough to keep you going for now. But if you want to set up as you mean to continue, then get yourself an e-commerce website. Yep. And, um, you know, you may not sell any books for a while, you may only sell one or two books a year and you've got to do the cost benefit analysis of that. So you want to try to find a, a, a retailer that's not, you're not going to have to pay monthly, you know, that's probably not the best idea, but, you know, pay in, integrate some sort of retailer that takes a cut of a book when you sell it, that makes the most sense. And so, you know, just something to think about. And, and like I said, it's a long-term play. Exactly. Um, All right. Well, yeah, go ahead. No, no, Sorry. go on. Yeah, we've okay. got another question well, yet. I was going yeah, to that, that, well, those were all the questions that I prepared for this session. I thought okay. we would uh, end with kind of cleaning up uh, any questions that are in the chat. Exactly. Let's do that because right. there are a few that kind of refer back to some of the topics we talked about. Yeah, MC Vasiago asks, if you have bought the copyright for your book illustrations, how do you give credit to the illustrator in the book itself? Do you still say the moral rights of the illustrator have been asserted? Uh, the, Interesting question. Yeah, great question. The moral rights of the illustrator have been asserted is a UK wording only outside of the UK. That, that kind of refers to, to U, the UK and um, whether well, maybe some other places, but it's not used everywhere is my point. Sorry, it is some other place, not UK only. Mm -hmm. Let me rephrase that. It's not used everywhere. Moral rights is an actual concept that I don't think is, is encompassed in American copyright law, for example. No, so what you need to do to credit your illustrator is on your copyright page, just say illustration and the illustrator's chosen name and link it through to their website in the um, ebook, uh, the digital editions. You can also in your acknowledgements thank them personally, which is, a, which is a nice touch. It's nice, I think, as indie authors to recognize our fellow creators and the part that they played in, in making the book because none of us managed to make our books on our own. Mm. So it, it's good to credit them there. So yeah, just a simple copyright um, you know, and credit to the illustrator is all that's needed. Yeah, because there's, there's different, if I remember correctly, there are different moral rights, right? One of them is attribution and that's absolutely how I would do that. So, and, and if you want to include them on the Amazon page too, in the byline, that might not be a bad way to at least send new work or new, new customers to your illustrator as well. Yes, absolutely. So. Your website, anywhere you, you kind of want to. And in a sense, it's in the act of doing that, that you are asserting their moral rights on their behalf. All right. Lorraine Turnbull asks, first time self-publishing, ebook and paperback on Amazon only. Would you buy an ISBN for the book or go free? Uh, Ally policy and recommendation is buy your own ISBNs. That makes you the publisher of record, um, not a, another platform. So take a look, Lorraine, at yesterday's blog post. It is, I don't know, about 4,000 words on ISBNs and the policy is up front. But essentially, again, understandable why indie authors may choose not to purchase ISBNs for cost reasons. But if you're mm -hmm. intending to publish more than one book 
outside of, you know, a family and friend group and you want to make a commercial um, profit from that book, then yes, it is highly recommended that you own your ISBNs. Yep, agree. Sally McGinty asks, small print reading led me to a policy from Amazon that if you have your ebook or if you publish your ebook anywhere else first, you cannot put it on Amazon ever. Am I reading that correctly? Um, I don't believe so, Sally. If if you have found such, now uh, policies are always changing at Amazon. Uh, if you have found such a, such a policy and if you have a link and you could send it through to us, we could have a look and see, is that the actual meaning or are the words leading you to kind of believe that? But um, I'm certainly not aware of that. And I don't yeah. think it's it's something that would be in their interests. I can't really see why they would do that. Yeah, I agree. I, I've never heard that before. So, um, you know, sometimes the legalese and the terms of service, it doesn't make sense. And um, sometimes sometimes you just have sometimes there's different interpretations of, of different terms and things like that. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, certainly if you if you see that, send that our way. And just to refer back, Sally, to your previous ISBN question. So we answered the thing about the reviews is that you can take over your reviews if there is this big question mark over your ISBN and it's giving you headaches and you're worried and wondering about the ProQuest thing and, and versus the Ingram Spark thing. Getting a new one and putting out a new edition might be the simplest answer. On the other hand, if you're happy about it, I would say that... Um, using if the book is exactly the same as it was and you haven't changed anything in terms of format or look or whatever then using the old isbn as you have already done that for such a long time i think you're fine to to leave there if however you have substantially changed anything about the book either in terms of its content or how you know the format the cover the binding any of that sort of thing you do need a new ISBN. So again, maybe refer to that blog post. All right. Well, that is all of our chat questions as well. So thank you, everybody, for such a lively chat this month. That's awesome. Yeah, brilliant. Keep those questions coming. We're always delighted to, to get them. Um, it's in the member Q&A section in the member zone. And uh, thanks to Michael for organizing everything. And um, yeah, his book, your self-publishing questions answered is going to compile the best of these and, and bring put them together into one publication in a short while. So we'll have more news on that next time. So see you in a month and um, yeah, happy writing, happy publishing, happy author business. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.